Good morning, and welcome to worship. Uh, the announcements for this week are found on pages 12, 13, and 14 of your worship booklets. We have printed plenty of bulletins sufficient for this service and next, so you do not need to return to us the ones that are in your hand. So you can take that home and refer particularly to the announcement section in the week ahead. Thank you to all the people who took me up on my offer last week and called me to ask me to make a visit, either to invite me over or to invite someone else. It was wonderful, wonderful to know that you heard me, wonderful to know that you knew that the offer was genuine, and wonderful that you took the time to reach out to me. So I'm going to announce it one more time. I love making visits. You know I can talk till the cows come home. I can even listen well, some of the time. And so I would love to spend time with you. Invite me over, I'll bring communion, uh, but just call I, I know that I'm here. Also feel free to tip me off to anyone else you know who might appreciate a call or a visit. A warm welcome to anyone visiting St. Armand's Key Lutheran Church for the first time today. If you didn't stop at the visitor's desk on the way into worship, please be sure to stop there on the way out of worship because we have gifts we'd like to give you. You'll also find on that desk my business card and the business card of Michael Bodnick, our Minister of Music. Take either or both cards, and if you need either or both of us in the coming week or weeks, give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. Is that correct, Michael? Love to hear from you. So, take us up on that offer. In the pews, you'll see visitor's cards. If you could just take a minute or two during worship to fill that out, and you can hand it to me at the door of the church, drop it in the offering bowls by the door of the church, leave it on the visitor's desk, however which way you return it to us, we'd love to be in touch. <clears throat> but again, <clears throat> oh, you might be in luck. Maybe I'm losing my voice today. Oh, who did that? Who, who did that? Was that you, Joe? <laughs> oh, Michael, I don't get no respect. Just for that, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> but again, on behalf of the family of St. Armand's Key Lutheran Church, welcome to worship. And now let's go. Michael, would you like to announce something? As many of you might know, um, Sarasota Magazine, SRQ Magazine, every year does a vote um, for the community uh, about the best best of the best in certain categories. And we are so proud of our own Pastor Ken Blythe, who was this year elected Sarasota's best faith leader. Congratulations, <laughs> Pastor Ken. Thank you. You see, Joe, some people like me. <laughs> now let's compose our hearts and our minds for worship.
Please stand. In the name of God, who makes a way in the wilderness, walks with us and guides us in our pilgrimage. Holy One, we confess that we have wandered far from You. We have not trusted Your promises. We have ignored Your prophets in our own day. We have squandered our inheritance of grace. We have failed to recognize You in our midst. Have mercy on us. Forgive us and turn us again to You. Teach us to follow in Your ways. Assure us again of Your love and help us to love our neighbor. Amen. <clears throat> Beloved in Christ, the Word draws near to you, and to all who call out to God shall be saved. In Jesus, God comes to you again and again and gathers you under wings of love. In Jesus' name, your sins are forgiven. God journeys with you and teaches you how to live in love. Amen. Let us pray. Creator God, you prepare a new way in the wilderness, and your grace waters our desert. Open our hearts to be transformed by the new thing you are doing, that our lives may proclaim the extravagance of your love given to all through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading is from the 43rd chapter of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings our chariot and horse, army and warrior, they lie down, they cannot rise, they are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me. 
the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they might declare my praise. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from the third chapter of Philippians. Paul writes, If anyone else has a reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law a Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, 
because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to John. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. So, the title of today's sermon is Antithesis, and that was what I wanted to preach on when I submitted the title. Yeah, less so now. I've kind of, in the weeks since I came up with that, I've changed the sermon a little. So, I may or may not come back to Antithesis. Where I was originally going was that antithesis are opposites, antitheses. They're, they're, they're the opposites of each other. And in this text today, there's life and death and love and betrayal. And maybe I'll preach on that someday, but this might not be the day. And the reason I've, I've wavered from that is, is just that the more I read this text, the more I realize just how much relevance it has to daily life. And and I know you probably think I'm crazy because it seems to be one of those texts that plays a vital role in the character and plot development of the gospel, but doesn't have that much life application. So, we look at it and we say, yeah, that has to come there, because Jesus has done this, gone there, doing that, and, and so much seems to come together in this text that drives where the gospel is going and drives where Jesus is going in the gospel. But as for us now, eh, it's, it's just a, it's a nice text, that's all. Except I think this short text has a lot to say about us and to us now. I mean, first of all, context, that's everything. So, this text, this passage comes almost immediately after the raising of Lazarus. So, Lazarus, Jesus' friend, has died. Jesus comes to Bethany. Lazarus is already dead, wrapped in burial cloth, and is in his tomb, and Jesus raises him from the dead. I say almost immediately because there is a little interlude between the raising of Lazarus and the text today, but they're interconnected. Um, the scene shifts to Jerusalem, to the Sanhedrin, which is the the council of elders uh, presided over by the high priest. And 
the Sanhedrin, the Council of Elders, has gotten wind of what Jesus did at Bethany. It's only a few miles from Jerusalem. Word reached them quickly, and they're not pleased. In fact, in John's gospel, this is what gets Jesus killed, the raising of Lazarus. Because after He's raised Lazarus, the council decides it's better for one man to die than for the whole nation to die. Jesus must be gotten rid of quickly. It has to happen because of what He did in Bethany. And now the story moves back to Bethany and to this meal that Jesus shares. So there's the back story. But here is the life application, and there are several of them, although, as I said a few minutes ago, they're not immediately obvious. The first is, notice what I've said about the Sanhedrin. Now, don't get me wrong, it is incredibly noble to give your life for the sake of the other whether in the military, a civilian, there is a nobility to it. In fact, there's such nobility to it that Jesus says in a passage that rings down through the centuries, greater love hath no one than this, than one lays down one's life for one's friends. There is, however, no nobility in sacrificing someone else for the sake of the whole. There is no nobility in what the Sanhedrin does. Better that one man die than all the people? No. That's not their decision to make. And yet we see in it what Bismarck calls real politique. You know? The down and dirty of politics, the down and dirty of nationhood, where, where someone looks around at the whole and says, for the benefit of the majority, I am willing to sacrifice the minority. And if it's a choice between all of them and just Him, meaning Jesus, that's easy. I think what disturbs me in that text is just how easy that decision is to make. They wash their hands of this wandering rabbi Jesus. Now, you and I might not be in that upper echelon of power where we get to decide who lives and who dies, but in our lowly perch where you and I find ourselves in the, in the great ladder of life, we do the same thing. We just don't realize it. We don't realize that when we have the opportunity to help and serve someone, we may be the only people separating that person from death or from suffering, from loneliness and abandonment. We have no idea, nor do we want to know, because what we don't know doesn't hurt us but what we don't know hurts the other, and that's a price we're willing to pay. In our daily lives, we have opportunities. There's a multiplicity of them. There are too many to count, and for the purposes of this sermon, too many to name. But in our daily lives, time after time after time, we make small, medium-sized, and large decisions of commission and omission. 
of actively turning away or unknowingly, just instinctively. And so, in our daily lives, to all intents and purposes, we do actually make that decision that it's better for one. It's better for one to go hungry. It's better for one to go homeless. It's better for one to wander the street. It's better for one to stay home alone. It's better for one to be evicted. It's better for one to not afford their prescription meds. It's better for one, better for one, if me and people like me are okay. I know that sounds harsh. And I know you may be saying to yourself, no, no, not me. But now that I've said it, tune in a little to those conscious and unconscious decisions we make day in, day out, where we decide that we'll sacrifice the other for the sake of the greater good. Well, boy, I really wish I could read my own handwriting from time to time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, good. This is, this is a good one. I'm glad I fi figured that one out. Everyone, when they read this passage, is fixated on the hair. You know? I mean, that's, it doesn't make sense. Why would you put costly nard which costs just a little under a year's wages, and wipe it off with your hair. Of course, there might be an interplay here with that other story in the Gospels, where it's the sinful woman who weeps at Jesus' feet and dries her tears off of His feet with her hair. But of course, she's a quote-unquote fallen woman, so revealing her hair publicly is just one scandal on top of a whole bunch of scandals. But for Mary to, to bear her hair publicly like that, let alone to allow her hair to touch the feet of a man, is scandalous. And down through the ages, we've either been fixated on that because A, it doesn't make sense, or B, we figured out the sense of it and we're offended by it. But of course, that's what we do, isn't it? We find things to be scandalized by, offended by. And to be honest, sometimes those things are what a colleague of mine refers to taking his car keys out of his pocket. Uh, Larry will say, hey, bright, shiny object, bright, shiny object. At the 11 o'clock, I'm going to put my car keys in my pocket. That would be better as a sort of show and tell. Bright, shiny object. Pay attention to this. Don't look at that. Pay attention to this. I think human nature is we zero in on whatever interests us or titillates us or allows us to be, you know, righteously indignant. There's nothing worse than a person who is righteously indignant. Meanwhile, we take our eyes off of what's really important. She bought the costly nard so that she would have it for the time of Jesus' death so that she could anoint the body. The only time you would ever anoint or put perfume on feet is when someone is dead and you anoint the body from head to top to bottom from crown of head to big toe. She is acting prophetically. There's an R in there, not pathetically, prophetically. She's not saving some of it for when he dies. He's getting all of it now. This woman who we're so caught up in the minutia of her hair and why it's out in public and why it's touching a guy's feet, she knows he's going to die. She is proclaiming that prophetically. It hasn't happened yet. She's pointing towards it. It's a clear signal, and it's an incredibly beautiful and tender moment. It's astoundingly beautiful. 
And the tenderness in the text is there for us to see and appreciate. But of course, in life, bright, shiny objects. Let's talk about our hair. Why not? Do you have any idea what goes on in life while we're busy looking at other things? This crazy way we have decided what gets priority and what doesn't, what demands our complete attention and what doesn't, the things we're willing to talk for hours about. I don't care what Will Smith did. I wasn't watching the Oscars anyway. I'm not going to watch multi-millionaires parade across the stage in hopes that they get enough publicity to earn some more millions. I just don't care. People are dying every minute in Ukraine. People are dying every minute in woods all around Sarasota. People are dying because they can't afford a doctor. People are dying all over the world because they have no fresh water, yet you and I run the hot faucet for a full five minutes waiting for the warm water to come through. But okay, let's talk about her hair. The thing about faith is it ought to give us a guide to prioritizing, to see what in the world really is important and what isn't, and to maybe enjoy from time to time the less important stuff. Sure, it can be fun, but the majority of our heart and conscience and mind and time and talent and treasure must go on what's ultimately important because some of this other stuff isn't even penultimately important. It barely should deserve a passing mention. Some scholars say that Judas is getting a bad rap in the gospel today, that someone, John, or someone from John's community, or, or, or a later scribe, threw this bit in about Judas stealing from the common purse, just to sort of add insult to injury. You know, he betrays Jesus, and if that's not enough, let's also talk about him being a thief. But I've got to tell you, this rings true to me, and I understand why scholars say this, and they may actually be right, but in the grand scheme of things, I think it passes the smell test, don't you? That th th this, this makes sense. Someone who lets their ethical guard down, sufficient to steal from the common purse, is in my mind exactly the kind of person who may ultimately do worse. I'm not saying there's a direct connection except that sometimes one thing leads to another. Sometimes the slope really is slippery. And sometimes we may fool ourselves into thinking, what I'm doing isn't really that bad. I mean, come on, in the grand scheme of stuff. And that might actually be true. Might not be the end of the world that we do X or Y or Z, sorry, Z. But, but sometimes we get quite comfortable with acting dishonestly, unethically. Sometimes those small things lead to big things. And, and I don't mean to add that to the mix of sounding legalistic, but there's parables about this. If the steward cannot be trusted with the small things, why should the steward be trusted with the big things? Yet, sometimes we have to say, this has to cease 
victimless though it may be. Because I will not find myself doing this. But it happens so easily. We excuse ourselves so easily. We let ourselves off the hook so easily. And pilfering the common purse. Maybe that made it so much easier to take the next step, which is to say to the Romans, to say to the high priests, please, the one whom I kiss is the one you're looking for. Lastly, Got to get a bigger bit of paper, Kenneth. <laughs> the last warning, I think, is we have to stop using Scripture as a club to hit each other over the heads with. We all have our favorite text that we will wield like a weapon with the least little provocation. Scripture is life-giving, not life-taking. It is good and honorable and worthy, and it is unworthy of us to use proof texts to attack each other. And I say that because of that last piece about the poor. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. If I had a dollar for the number of people who've said to me, you know, you just can't do enough for them. It's always a them, because if we knew their name, we would be ashamed. You just can't do enough for them. They're always going to be in that predicament. They're always going to be down and out. They're always going to be here. Jesus said, the poor will be with you always. So, what's the big deal? Except Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy. And here's what's said in Deuteronomy. Since there will never cease to be some in need on the earth, I therefore command you, open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor in your land. The full scriptural quotation tells us that we are to do everything for the poor, and yet we'll take Jesus' words as an excuse to do zilch, zero, nothing, nada, not a bit. We'll use scripture to wash our hands and then discover sometimes too late and at a high cost that Scripture tells us to pour ourselves out, not keep ourselves locked tight, to be generous, not miserly, to extend a hand and not show a boot. I think this text says a lot to us about our daily living here, now, in this place, us, we people of God, while at the same time, as we have come almost to the start of Holy Week and the Triduum, the great three days, we see Jesus preparing even now for His death. And we see tenderness and love and care, the same tenderness and love and care that we've shown Him as He's taken down from the cross and carried to the nearby tomb. The cross is just on the horizon but so too is the resurrection. Amen.
Please stand as together we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, <coughs> born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Do a new thing in the church. Free us from paradigms that no longer serve the gospel and bring forward leaders who imagine fresh ways of doing ministry. Give us courage in the face of change. Merciful God. Do a new thing for creation. Reverse the traje tra trajectory of climate change and environmental ca 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 catastrophe. Revive habitats already impaired by human disregard. Amplify the voices of climate, climate scientists and researchers working to chart a new course. Merciful God. Do a new thing for those fleeing violence. As you guided the Israelites to a new land by pillars of cloud and fire, now travel alongside those fleeing war in Ukraine. Provide them with what they need as they travel and guide them to places of welcome and sanctuary. Merciful God. Do a new thing for those who suffer. Reveal a path for any who are unemployed or underemployed for those experiencing homelessness, and for all who struggle with money. Comfort those who grieve and restore those who are sick, especially Carol Malcolm, Sam Myers, John Numrich, Marley Robinson, David Ross, Mary Ellen Shoup, and those we name in our hearts. Merciful God. Do a new thing within us. Direct us into encounters that broaden our understanding of the human experience. Amplify voices that are ignored or devalued. Deliver us especially from the scourge of racism. Merciful God. Do a new thing in our death. Fill us with the knowledge of Christ and the power of his resurrection as we give thanks for all the saints who have attained the prize of their heavenly call. Merciful God. Accept the prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of a world in need, for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated.
extravagant God, you have blessed us with the fullness of creation. Now we gather at your feast where you offer us the food that satisfies. Take and use what we offer here. Come among us and feed us with the body and blood of Christ, in whose name we pray. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. God most mighty, O God most merciful, O God our rock and our salvation, hear us as we praise you, call us to your table, grant us your life. When the earth was a formless void, you formed order and beauty. When Abraham and Sarah were barren, you sent them a child. When the Israelites were enslaved, you led them to freedom. Ruth faced starvation, David fought Goliath, and the psalmists cried out for healing, and full of compassion, you granted the people your life. You entered our sorrows in Jesus, our brother. He was born among the poor. He lived under oppression. He wept over the city. With infinite love, he granted the people your life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering his death, we cry out, Amen. Amen. Celebrating his resurrection, we shout, Amen. Amen. Trusting his presence in every time and place, we plead, Amen. Amen. O God, you are breath. Send your Spirit upon this meal. O God, you are bread. Feed us with yourself. O God, you are wine. Warm our hearts and make us one. O God, you are fire. Transform us with hope. O God, most majestic. O God, most motherly. O God, our strength and our song. You show us a vision of the tree of life with fruits for all and leaves that heal the nations. Grant us such life, the life of the Father to the Son, the life of the Spirit of our risen Savior, life in you, now and forever. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, 
forever and ever. Amen. Here is food and drink for the journey. Take and be filled.
Please stand. Let us pray. Blessed Jesus, in this rich meal of grace, you have fed us with your body, the bread of life. Now send us forth to bear your life-giving hope to a world in need. You are children of God, anointed with the oil of gladness and strengthened for the journey. Almighty God, motherly, majestic, and mighty, bless you this day and always. Amen. Go in peace. Jesus meets you on the way.